for coming here. I'm going to say a few comments, and then we're going to move the program along into the lunch speakers. Uh, my comments essentially are to thank everyone for coming. Some of you have traveled very long distance to talk about this issue. Uh, I personally believe that school choice is an issue without peer. That it is, in my opinion, without exaggeration, the single most important issue facing this nation right now. And I think it is that because it goes fundamentally to so many problems we see across our society. It goes fundamentally to what I see as the single greatest disgrace of this nation today, which is the condition of the elementary and secondary school education for many of the poor and disenfranchised in the inner cities in this country. This nation was built upon being a nation of opportunity. And our current system is failing to provide that opportunity. We are raising generation after generation of children who are trapped. Kids who are trapped in schools, not all of them, but many schools in the inner cities, many schools in the poorest neighborhoods, kids who are trapped with no hope and no way to get out. Kids who are trapped with no real prospect of getting an education, with no real prospect of escaping illiteracy, with no real prospect of ever having a chance to get anywhere out of the ghetto, with no real prospect of escaping the crime and violence that plagued these neighborhoods. School choice, in my opinion, is the most important issue in the nation today because it cuts to the very core of all of the root causes of those problems. Because with an education, a child can do anything. With an education, a child can conquer any circumstance and any outside factors. And what school choice is all about is giving those kids, those kids that right now are facing a very bleak future, giving them a promise of hope. School choice, in my opinion, is not only incredibly important, it is also, I believe, incredibly simple. Incredibly simple to understand what it's about. <laughs> I will never forget a story that was told me by a very good friend of mine who's active in litigating many of these school choice cases. She told me a story about a client of hers, a very large man, about 6'6", 280 pounds, who had his daughter in a school and was receiving a voucher to pay for her to go to school. And when a court shut that program down, her client looked at her and began to weep openly weep. And he looked at her and asked one very simple question. Why? Why won't they let me send my little girl to school? That's what this issue is about. It isn't about a bunch of academics discussing interesting theories intersecting in a hypothetical world of what the platonic norm would be for the ideal education. It's about helping kids have a future. All someone has to do to understand school choice and to understand it in their belly is to think for a second what it would feel like to be in that situation. Think for a second what it would feel like. Most of the people in this room did not face that. But imagine for a second you're living in an inner city and for whatever reason you don't have a job, you don't have financial resources, but you do have a little girl. And the only place you can send her is the local school with a 60% dropout rate, with rampant illiteracy, with drug dealers in the hallway, with little girls being raped in the bathroom. That's what you're facing. I personally cannot imagine the hopelessness and desperation of a mother or father facing that situation with no place else to go. 
And the reason why most of the people in this room never face that, the reason why you don't see schools like that in middle and upper class neighborhoods, is if you did, there wouldn't be any kids in there. If there were a school in Bel Air, or in Greenwich, Connecticut, or in Bethesda, Maryland, where the kids were getting shot, where nobody was learning, nobody would send their kids there. Every single one of the parents would say, not with my little girl, not with my little boy. And they would exercise choice. They would pull out the oldest voucher in the world, which is their wallet. And they'd pay to send their kids somebody else. People all the time say, well, these voucher things, I, I don't understand them. They're confusing. They're complicated. Will they work? What will happen? And they give, paint all sorts of apocalyptic pictures of a world with vouchers. But as I said, to my mind, vouchers are very simple. And we've seen them for a very long time. Because all vouchers are is giving the poor the identical choice the rich and middle class have always had. That's all vouchers are doing. It's saying to these poor parents, you have the same ability of choice that the comfortable family in Bethesda has. And if your kids are faced with a school that's not teaching them, where their life and their safety is in danger, you have the ability to do what every other parent with the financial wherewithal to do can and would do. Send your kids somewhere else. When you realize that, when you focus on the desperation of the children and the fact that vouchers give the parents and the kids a window of hope and opportunity out, all of the other arguments against vouchers, to my mind, crumble. <coughs> because it becomes fundamentally an issue of justice and what is right. An issue of we as a nation and a people making our promise of being a land of opportunity, making that promise a reality. The only way a voucher will have any effect at all is if individual parents and individual students decide they can get something better than what they've got today. You could give vouchers to every parent in a school, and if they were all happy with the school, nobody moves. The only way a voucher does anything is if those parents decide, there's something better for my little boy, there's something better for my little girl. And unlike some that criticize voucher programs, I don't think those parents are ill-equipped to make that decision. I'm willing to trust the parents and the kids to do things to find the hope and opportunity for those kids. I don't think the parents of the poor are any stupider than rich parents or love their kids any less. And I think that if we can provide a system that gives them a way out, gives them a ticket to opportunity, we can change a myriad of social problems and act in the way that is true and right. A final observation. Even if it were not true that at its base and its core this was about justice and providing hope, even if we were to sit for just a moment and to engage in cold political calculus, school choice is an issue whose time has come. It is an issue with momentum behind it. It is an issue. Go to the inner cities, take a look at every survey that has been done of minority parents in the inner cities, the people facing these schools. The numbers are overwhelming. 70, 80% support for school vouchers. The parents whose kids are going to these schools understand this problem. They don't have to be explained what the alternative is. They understand this problem. Those same voters, when asked, what is the most important issue you care about when you go to the ballot box? Those same parents say education. 
politically, this is the issue of the future. And right now, many of the politicians are not responding to that need. They're not responding to that need because the off-reference soccer moms are confused by and don't quite understand the relevance of this. Because after all, the public school in Bethesda is doing just great. So why are these people complaining and wanting some voucher thing? But when politicians and leaders realize that you have a situation where justice and fairness and equality converge with doing the politically smart thing, I believe school choice will be the issue for the ages. With those comments, I'd like to introduce Corey Swanson from the Stranahan National Issues Forum to welcome you all and to present an award to his dean. It's a pleasure to have you all here. We're very pleased that, that everyone has turned out. Um, as one of the co-founders of the Stranahan National Issues Forum, um, it's been my pleasure to work with Dean Quick since 1995. And um, Dean Quick has been exceptionally supportive of our program. His, his encouragement and guidance has helped the program become uh, very successful. And Dean, as, as many of you know, Dean Quick will retire as Dean at the end of the year here. And the Stranahan National Issues Forum would like to recognize you uh, with this plaque, which simply reads, um, the Stranahan National Issues Forum recognizes Dean Albert T. Quick for a strong commitment to establishing a diverse and supportive intellectual environment at the University of Cleveland College of Law, 1995 to 1999. We want to thank you. Corey, uh, I, I did not uh, realize that was going to happen. I'm here to, uh, of course, introduce the uh, main speaker. Uh, so, again, I will start off and say my name is Albert Quick, and I am dean of the University of Toledo College of Law. I bring an official welcome not only from the uh, College of Law, of course, but also from the University of Toledo. We're delighted to see you all here. I had the opportunity to sit in on part of the uh, panel just before lunch. Uh, I thought uh, the level of uh, um, debate and discussion at that panel was just uh, excellent. So I'm sure that you're going to have a uh, the same type of uh, great level of uh, debate discussion in the afternoon. You, you should look forward to a great uh, conference. Uh, I have, of course, uh, the distinct pleasure of introducing our luncheon speaker, Linda Chavez. And the New York Times, of course, called Linda Chavez, quote, an in influential voice on civil rights policy. The Washington Post has described her as one of the, quote, new generation of intellectuals seeking to question the authority of civil rights establishment. Uh, this latter quote probably refers to Ms. Chavez's stance on bilingual education, maybe affirmative action in college admissions. As you know, Ms. Chavez is president of the Center for Equal Opportunity, which is uh, based in Washington, D.C., and, and has previously held political positions among them, White House Director of Public Liaison, Director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. She has, as you all know, a syndicated column that appears in newspapers across the country, has written for other publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and several other publications. She's written a, a prize-winning book, makes regular appearances on their television and news shows. Uh, we are so delighted that she's able to come to Toledo today and to give this luncheon address. Please welcome Linda Chavez. Thanks very much, Dean Quirk. It's a pleasure to be here in Toledo. I must tell you, I always have trouble getting to Toledo. Last time I came here was to the Tran uh, Stranahan uh, lecture series, and that time I got stranded in Cincinnati in a snowstorm. Uh, this time when I showed up at the airport yesterday, my plane was going to be so late getting into Cincinnati where I could then catch the trip here that I decided to stay home. So uh, I came, flew in this morning at the ungodly hour of 6.30 a.m., and I am usually fast asleep, so I hope I'm uh, awake by now. But it is a pleasure to be here, and I must tell you, that initially when I was invited uh, to speak, I thought, well, you know, I don't 
talk on the subject of school choice. And in fact, uh, for many years, I was somewhat of an agnostic on this subject, was not quite sure uh, what my position was. Um, the court did not mention that among my uh, previous employers was not only Ronald Reagan, uh, but a man for whom I worked uh, many, many more years, uh, Al Shanker at the American Federation of Teachers. Uh, and uh, so I wasn't quite sure whether or not it made sense to come and talk about this. My issues, as the Dean suggested, uh, really center around race, uh, language issues, and higher education. And uh, I wasn't sure what I would have to contribute. Then I started thinking back on, on many of the debates that I've participated in over the last couple of years on the question of racial preferences in higher education and college admissions. And I realized that whether it was a debate or whether it was a lecture that I was giving, that uh, at the end of the day, the debate always centered around what to do if you eliminate the current system of racial preferences in higher education. What is it you're going to do to open up opportunity and make um, our institutions of higher education not uh, stratified uh, by race? And when, inevitably, when that subject comes up, I find myself arguing for opening up uh, the education choices of Americans and eliminating the monopoly that public schools now have on the education of poor children in the United States, and at least uh, considering going to either a voucher system or tuition tax credit system or some system that allow parents, once again, to be the the um, people who decide what is best for their children's education and pick the schools that their children attend, which of course, as Ted suggested, uh, many parents in the United States already had that right. My children, by the way, went to the Bethesda Public Schools uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. So, um, so I thought, well, I will come and talk to you about this, but I'm going to approach the subject of uh, school vouchers through a back door, and I'm going to approach it by talking to you a little bit about what uh, we at the Center for Equal Opportunity have found out uh, over the last three years as we have conducted a series of studies on higher education admissions. Now, I've been debating the subject of quotas and racial preferences for virtually all of my adult life, uh, going back to the early 1970s. And initially, when uh, we would debate the subject of whether or not there was such a thing as racial preference in college admissions, I was frequently told by deans of admissions, by presidents of universities, by people who sat on the admissions boards, that in fact affirmative action in higher education uh, did not amount to double standards and that uh, minority students were being admitted under the same standards as uh, other students uh, to the college. Uh, and that if there was any note given in terms of uh, students' uh, racial background, it was done in order to recognize that uh, disadvantaged students uh, might not have had equal preparation. And there might be some nod given in the direction of disadvantaged status, and that often coincided with race. But that race itself uh, was not the deciding factor in admitting students, and that Certainly, there was no double standard in terms of the uh, qualifications for admissions uh, among students. And I was told this at a variety of uh, colleges and universities around the country, and yet it, uh, in fact, conflicted what, with um, what I was being told by members of the faculty and by students themselves about what was going on. And so I decided that the only way to really get a handle on this and to settle this question was to begin to take a look at that the issue and to try and amass some empirical evidence. And so, having started uh, my political life uh, on the left of center, I was very familiar with the tactics of the left and something called the Freedom of Information Act um, was something that I was quite familiar with that liberal organizations had used over the years to good effect. And I decided uh, to go in under freedom of information laws in the various states and to request <coughs> information about the uh, admission of students uh, from public colleges and universities in those states. And we now have a project going that is uh, asked this kind of information from more than half of all of the states uh, in the United States. And we have, to date, been able to publish studies in eight states. Uh, we've looked at the admission practices of, of California, Colorado, 
uh, North Carolina, Virginia, the state of Washington, uh, and uh, the two military uh, academies, at Na uh, Naval Academy and uh, the Military Academy at West Point, and uh, in Michigan. And those are the um, eight areas that, that we have so far published our data. And what we have found is that if you look at the qualifications of students who are admitted uh, to these colleges and universities, there are very wide disparities, and those disparities uh, are in fact uh, correlated uh, very highly with race. And that, for example, at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, black students admitted um, come in with, uh, on average, uh, SAT scores that are more than 300 points lower than the average scores of white and Asian students admitted, and they come in with grades that are about a half a point uh, lower. Uh, and we have found this kind of, of pattern in every state that we've studied, uh, with some few exceptions for individual schools within states. For example, George Mason, University of Virginia, seem not to have uh, any evidence of uh, racial preference in admissions there. We also conducted uh, studies to see what the probability of being admitted was uh, based on race, uh, looking at uh, hypothetically identical students, so same test scores, same grades, uh, and uh, having uh, the only difference between them being race. And we found, for example, that at the University of Virginia, uh, a um, black student with identical grades and uh, SAT scores would have a 45 times greater likelihood of being admitted than a white student or an Asian student would. At uh, the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor, we found that uh, similarly situated black and white students, a black student would have a 174 times greater likelihood of being admitted than an identically uh, qualified white student. Well, it's clear, uh, looking at this evidence, that schools are taking race into account, and they're doing it in order to meet the mandate of having a diverse student body, and they want to have a racial balance in their schools, they want to bring in more minority students. Now, some of us uh, find that objectionable, just not just as a matter of policy, but we believe it is, with respect to state schools, constitutionally impermissible. Uh, that the 14th Amendment of the Constitution says you can't differentiate between people based on their skin color and you cannot be preferring one group uh, over another or one individual over another based on his or her uh, racial or ethnic background. Uh, and in places like California uh, and most recently in the state of Washington, uh, those of us who have favored uh, race-neutral admissions have been successful in getting changes uh, through uh, the initiative project uh, process to the state constitution. And so we now have a ban on that kind of racial preference admissions uh, in both California and in Washington. And through a slightly different process, through a uh, court case, uh, there is a similar ban now in effect in the uh, Fifth Circuit uh, knocking down a uh, program that, that used race um, and used different qualifications uh, in the state of Texas. And we now have uh, a, a couple of years of experience under the California program to take a look at what it means in terms of college admissions. And lo and behold, lots of people said it was going to mean huge change the resegregation of higher education in California. And indeed, the early stories that came out of California with respect to what happened after the initiative passed and after the university uh, regents uh, began to change the admissions policies, and they determined that, in fact, there was a very large drop in terms of black and Latino admissions. Although the New York Times and the uh, LA Times and all of the major papers in the country uh, first reported uh, a catastrophic drop. Uh, their figures came from only two of the campuses uh, in the state, from the University of California at Berkeley and UCLA. And it turned out a month or six weeks later when the entire system released its uh, data, there was indeed a drop of about 24% in overall black enrollment throughout the system. <coughs> Uh, a much smaller drop of about 6% uh, among Latino students. Nonetheless, it was clear that there were fewer uh, black students and Latino students being admitted under these race-neutral standards. Well, now we are faced with um, a debate, a growing debate, about whether this is good or bad as a matter of public policy. 
And uh, if uh, it uh, is going to be the law of the land, uh, if not nationally, at least in certain states, what uh, can be done to try to increase those numbers? Because even those of us who are adamantly opposed to racial preferences are disturbed by the fact that there are 24% fewer black students in the University of California system. I don't think that's anything to be proud of. It's something to be concerned about and worried about. And so we're now faced with what to do about it. Well, uh, the proponents of racial preference programs have come up with a variety of solutions to try to get around uh, the uh, race neutrality and admissions and to try and, and increase those numbers. And one of the things that has been suggested recently, first in Texas and now in California, is uh, simply to move away from such heavy reliance on test scores and grades and to go to a system where uh, the university simply admits the top tier of students from its schools uh, in the state. So that if you are in Texas and you are among the top 10% of your graduating class, whether that be in a private, parochial, or a public school, uh, you will be guaranteed admission to the University of Texas. And there's a current proposal now uh, being offered in California that would uh, make it somewhat more elite, the top 4% of, of the graduating class of, of uh, students in the state of California, but that you would be guaranteed admission. And a lot of people are looking at that and saying, gee, this is uh, a good idea because, of course, it will increase the number of black and Latino students because we all know that uh, education in the United States, in the public schools at least, uh, is uh, very concentrated uh, by race and that black students are far more likely to go to school uh, in majority black schools, Latino students in majority Latino students, and white students in majority white schools. And if we're just taking the top tier and going by the percentages, uh, we will guarantee that there will be roughly a proportional number of black and Latino students because they're going to come from those black and Latino schools. And that will solve our dilemma. We will have a race neutral system uh, and we'll get the requisite number of minorities, but we'll do it in a way that at least seemingly is race neutral. Well, I've heard about these proposals and I've given them some thought and I must tell you that my first reaction is that what this will do is precisely what the affirmative action programs of the 1960s and 1970s accomplished and that is it will once again sweep under the rug the differences in the quality of education that exist in our inner city schools compared to the quality that exists in schools like the schools my children attended in Bethesda, Maryland. That it will simply allow for poorly performing inner city schools with majority black and Latino school populations to continue to graduate students and so long as they graduate at the top of that very uh, mediocre class, they'll be guaranteed a spot in higher education. But what will happen to them once they're in that higher education? And I venture to guess that 10 or 15 years ago uh, from now, when I am uh, about to go into retirement and I'm still doing my empirical studies of higher education in the United States, if I were to go back at that point and take a look at how those black and Latino students perform, <coughs> they will continue to underperform their white peers in those higher education institutions, just as the beneficiaries of affirmative action today are underperforming their white and Asian peers uh, in the schools they attend now. Because simply sweeping under the rug uh, the failure to teach the basic skills that are necessary to succeed in higher education is exactly what we have been doing. So I don't see this as any kind of solution. I don't see trying to solve the problem of what we're going to do about the decline in minority students uh, enrollment if we move to a race neutral system is in any way going to fix the problem. And it comes back to what has been clear to me from the very beginning about affirmative action programs. And that is that they ignore the kind of skills gap that exists at the elementary and secondary school level. And that that skills gap is not going to disappear so long as we have a monopoly system in which children who come from poor families have extraordinarily limited choice 
to attend only the school that is nearest their home uh, and a state-supported school. So long as the public schools are insulated from the kind of competition that comes in a system where you have choices, I don't believe that we're going to see the change necessary to improve the quality of those public schools. And I say that as somebody who, for many years, worked as an advocate for public education, and who believes to this day that um, public education uh, can uh, be uh, effective uh, given the right circumstances. It was effective for my children. I don't believe that so long as there is not competition that you're going to do anything fundamental about the quality of education that black and Latino students receive in the United States. And unless we open up that door to allowing for parents to make choices about which schools their children will attend, I don't see this as changing. And I look at it a little bit um, as I would uh, competition in other areas. And I was reminded uh, when Mr. Lawrence talked today about unions and uh, the AFTs being willingness to uh, look at uh, technology, that one of the things I often used to hear Al Shanker uh, bemoan, both publicly and privately, was the way in which some of his colleagues in the labor movement uh, viewed technology and competition as a threat. It was one of the reasons I think Al Shanker was a more successful union leader than uh, many of uh, his colleagues in the labor union movement. And I think back in particular about what happened to Detroit. And I look back to the kinds of cars that Detroit was making in the 1970s that had become large, not particularly reliable uh, gas guzzlers that were not, in fact, meeting the market demands of American drivers. And what happened when a few imports started uh, to spill in. And what happened when Americans were suddenly given a choice of buying a cheaper, more reliable Japanese car compared with uh, buying uh, a car made by Americans. And in droves, Americans rushed to buy those Japanese cars. And of course, the UAW and uh, other affiliated unions uh, all bemoaned this. They resisted it. Uh, they condemned it. Uh, their, uh, uh, supporters in the Congress uh, would like to have uh, stopped it uh, by uh, putting on various kinds of tariffs and uh, eliminating free trade. Uh, but in fact, what happened was uh, consumers continued to demand uh, uh, those uh, Japanese imports. And what happened was Detroit decided that either they were going to have to compete and start to produce the kind of cars that Americans want to drive, or they were going to go out of business. They were going to go bankrupt. Well, I think the analogy is an analogy that works for education as well. Uh, I think if uh, the public schools uh, do have to compete with Catholic schools and other uh, both sectarian and non-sectarian <coughs> private schools for uh, students, that that is going to improve the quality of their product far better and far faster than any kind of mandated education reform that comes from Washington or comes from state capitals uh, around the country. The competition in the free market system uh, works to uh, improve a product far better, far more efficiently than uh, any kind of state regulation. Now, it is not just my concern about uh, what happens in terms of higher education and the population of black and Latino students who will one day be entering uh, colleges and universities that brings me uh, to support uh, the notion of, of school vouchers. Uh, there is another population, a population that will increasingly be important to the future of the United States, and that population is a population of immigrants that are coming to the US. And with respect to the education of immigrants in the public schools, Certainly with respect to the education of the single largest immigrant group uh, now in our public schools, Latino children, uh, those from immigrating from uh, Latin America, uh, the monopoly of public education has done more than uh, simply uh, produce a mediocre product uh, which is failing to teach them the skills uh, they need in the math area, and the reading area, etc. It is, in many school districts around the country, 
denying them what I consider a very basic right of any person living in the United States, and that is the right to learn how to read and write and speak English well. Uh, in fact, public education uh, in the United States now mandates for Latino students in school districts around the country that these students, uh, if they come into school with uh, a language other than English as their first language, uh, that these students will in, ta in fact be taught to read and write uh, first in their native language and uh, for the most part 80 to 90 percent of these programs are programs that affect Spanish-speaking children. These students are being denied the right to learn English in the public schools. Now interestingly, uh, public schools are not the only uh, available education uh, programs for immigrants as they are uh, uh, you know, as, as, as with other students, uh, there are other uh, alternative means, and because so many of the immigrant students who are coming into the United States now, uh, particularly the Latinos, are in fact Catholic, many of those immigrant children are in fact going into Catholic education. Interestingly, Catholic schools um, have, do not have bilingual <coughs> education programs. Uh, Catholic schools teach immigrant children by emphasizing English as a second language or using English immersion uh, techniques. And clearly, since the parents of these children are in fact paying for their education, this is a choice that those parents are exercising. <coughs> in the last year, uh, the people in the state of California have had a chance to uh, voice their opinion about uh, language education and, and what is best for immigrant children and they voted through the initiative process once again to adopt uh, an initiative that bans uh, bilingual education except for those parents who in fact uh, request it. The system now is that if you have a child as my child was when he entered uh, the first grade named Pablo Chavez Gersten I got sent home a letter in Spanish informing me that he was going to go into a bilingual program. Um, I was quickly on the telephone and Pablo uh, did not, in fact, end up in that program. Uh, but if I were a Linda Chavez uh, Guatemalan uh, housekeeper uh, with a fourth grade education, the likelihood is Pablo would have been put into that bilingual program. I would not have understood my rights and uh, to this day uh, he would uh, probably uh, uh, not be doing as well as he is. Uh, the system as it works in public schools now is that parents, although by law have the right to opt out of bilingual programs, most school districts deny them that right, uh, deny the parents even knowledge of their right uh, to remove the kids. Uh, and what the California Initiative has, has done is uh, simply to uh, make teaching of English uh, the norm and uh, for any parents who request bilingual education, make that the exception. So I see um, what happens to immigrant children and what happens to native-born black and Latino children as one of the most important arguments for uh, school vouchers and for opening up to competition uh, the current uh, public school monopoly on education. I think if we are going to be a nation that is truly uh, a nation of equal opportunity for all, a nation in which uh, your racial or class background does not in fact determine what your future is, that we have to make uh, our uh, education uh, opportunities available uh, the same one and to all. And that the only way that that is going to be um, feasible and workable is to end the kind of monopoly that we now have on uh, public education and to allow parents to have uh, a, a much stronger um, uh, choice in being able to choose the schools that their children attend. Now, do I think that will be the end of public education in America? No, I don't. Um, I think that there will be a lot of parents who, number one, opt in, as I did, living in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and there'll be some parents uh, who will not take advantage of the opportunity to opt out of the system and whose children uh, will remain uh, behind in poorly performing public schools uh, because they don't have uh, the uh, wherewithal to remove them. But I do believe that even if that means that some children uh, get left behind and that not everyone takes advantage of, of the opportunity, 
that the quality of education will in fact uh, be enhanced and improved uh, by the competition that public schools uh, will certainly have to face in terms of, of competing for students. Uh, and I believe that that uh, will uh, allow uh, America's uh, poorest black and Latino students to be able to exercise the rights and the privileges uh, that uh, today accrue only to those who are middle class uh, and largely white. Thank you very much. Open it up to questions. Yes. When you were citing the uh, statistics of the decline in African American and Latino enrollment, how are those statistics normed? Are they, are they basically on percentage of population before those people groups are, you know, was it uh, based on what was the population the year prior? It was uh, what was the population the, the year prior. Uh, under Proposition 209, which was enacted in 1996, uh, it outlawed the use of, of, of race as uh, it, racial preference in college admissions. And the university regions also adopted their own procedure, which essentially eliminated their racial preference uh, programs. Uh, and, and what these uh, statistics I cited um, show is the drop the first year the universities moved to a race neutral standard. I should, by the way, um, emphasize that when you look at the entire <coughs> University of California system, although there was that 24% decline among blacks and 6% and among Latinos, uh, it was not evenly distributed. The largest gap, the largest decline was at Berkeley and at UCLA. And there were actually three of the eight uh, universities in the system actually had double digit increases in the number of black and Latino students. Uh, Riverside, uh, Santa Cruz, and Irvine, I believe, was the third. Would that tend to show them that instead of choosing those universities, they simply chose another university? So they didn't go out of the system, they just went elsewhere. Well, I would assume that because there was an overall, there was an, an absolute decline in 24% blacks, that they, they obviously did go out of the system. They may have gone to other schools in California. They may have ended up in the state college system. California has a very heavily tiered system with the university system being at the top tier, then the state colleges, and then there are community colleges. Uh, there is basically a, an institution of higher education for anybody who graduates high school in California. There is a place somewhere in the system. The problem in the old racial preference uh, admissions was that there was a lot of mismatching that went, uh, went on. And when we did our studies, one of the things we looked at was not just who got in, but who graduated. And we found that uh, they matched almost perfectly. The larger the gap in SAT scores and grades between black and white students, the larger the gap in graduation rates between black and white students. So they were very, very highly correlated. Um, you know, there may have been other factors besides uh, under preparation, but they certainly uh, were correlated with those differences in, in preparation. Yes? Um, I wonder why there's no talk of uh, trying to improve the public schools or the neighborhoods. Um, using your automotive analogy, we all know that with government help, Lee Iacocca was able to turn around Chrysler and look what it's become today. It's uh, become a Mercedes uh, Benz. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why is there no talk of uh, improving public schools? Well, first of all, I think there, there has been a lot of talk about improving uh, public education. In fact, the Republicans are right now in a contest with the Democrats to see who can spend more on public education in terms of federal spending. Uh, the amount of money that has gone into public education over the last 30 years uh, has increased dramatically at the same time that the money was going up, the scores were declining. Uh, I'm not going to suggest that there's a cause and effect there, but I will tell you that the reverse is not true either. It is not simply true that you can pour more money uh, into the schools and expect a better product. I mean, the, the reasons for the decline in, in public schools are many and varied, uh, and they are not all the fault of the teachers' union. I will be first. Uh, to say uh, a great deal of what's wrong has to do with some very important changes that have taken place in the family uh, in inner cities. When you have a decline in family, and we have children coming increasingly from single family homes, when you have neighborhoods that are drug ridden, uh, this is going to have an impact on the schools. You also have a lot of mandates coming down to the schools that have nothing to do with the basic mission of, of education. 
Uh, when you have schools now being forced to provide for the nutrition needs, the medical needs, the psychological needs, uh, not to mention the, you know, the need to indoctrinate in certain politically corrupt uh, ideologies, uh, that's a lot less time to teach reading and writing and arithmetic. And so there, there, there are a lot of reasons why the quality of public schools has declined. Uh, but uh, I would venture to say that the only way you're going to see an increase in that quality is to open them up to competition. Michael. Um, I thought that California Proposition 209 um, stood for the proposition of abolishing race and sex consideration in terms of mission and education. And in moving towards like, both the race and sex line policy. If that's the case, how do you explain the, the simultaneous movement in California to establish new public schools for girls only? Well, you and I disagree on this subject, Michael. As, 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 you, as you well know, um, I actually think there are big differences between segregating on the basis of race and segregating on the basis of sex. One actually I'm has. Two, I'm talking about 209. Well, 209 um, does not, all 209 says that there shall be no discrimination uh, or preference on the basis of race or sex. And um, I don't know how they're getting around that because obviously we have the Brown decision that says separate but equal, uh, separate can never be equal. And so since, since 209 mentioned sex, I don't, I don't know um, how they're getting around that. Uh, I will tell you that one of the questions I'm frequently asked in terms of the studies that we do is why don't you look at sex uh, in terms of differentials and wh whether there's any, uh, whether there really is affirmative action with respect to sex going on in, in higher education institutions. It's clear that there are probably some departments that are affected by it and they're probably uh, in graduate schools, uh, there may be uh, some affirmative action programs in which there are, is sexual preference given to, to females. Um, in some programs. At the undergraduate level, we did actually begin to ask those statistics, and we found that when we started getting them, that there were no differences, and so we quit uh, We quit looking at the question. Yes? One of our earlier panelists, uh, Mr. Mintzberg, was talking about how, uh, with the advent of Alcas, what we could expect to see is more government requirements, uh, accountability uh, in, the, in the private schools, in the religious schools. Are you concerned, or, or should people who uh, have their children in private schools or support vouchers be concerned that uh, bilingual education requirements would be extended to to the Catholic schools? Well, I think you specifically about. mentioned that as, as a possibility. Yes, I am concerned about that. I'll be very frank with you about that. It's always seemed to me uh, the best argument against um, having uh, vouchers or some other form, direct or indirect, of government aid to uh, private and parochial schools. Uh, I can remember, I'm old enough to have gone to school in the 1950s when the uh, whole question of, of uh, religion and, and religious uh, funding of religious schools first uh, began to be litigated through the courts. And I can remember the nuns in my school, you know, arguing very forcefully against state aid to Catholic schools because they'd come in and make us uh, uh, adopt public school textbooks. And they were very concerned about that. So I, I do think it's a legitimate issue. I think it's something that has to be considered. Uh, I've seen, you know, I, uh, I liked uh, Jean Volokh's uh, little diagrams of, of the way in which education is not very different from some of these other indirect subsidies uh, to religious institutions, and he mentioned welfare. Well, in fact, uh, in San Francisco, the archdiocese uh, has, in fact, been forced to change some of its hiring practices in order to participate in some programs in which it receives. Um, uh, assistance. So this is a concern to me. I don't think it is something that those of us who care about these issues uh, should, again, sweep under the rug. I think it's a legitimate issue. It's one we have to grapple with. But I balance it with the question of you know the crisis we have in public education today and what I consider the very unequal uh, educational opportunities of black and Latino kids in America. And I say it's an experiment that we ought to at least try. Um, and we ought to see. Uh, and we can go slowly, and it can begin as it has in many places as an experimental program. Uh, but it's something I think that, that at this point is, is worth trying. Yes? Um, Lily, you're, um, there's been a lot of talk about markets and competition here already right, this morning. There'll be more this afternoon. Uh, and you made the analogy to the automobile market. So you also seem to be someone who's very um, kind of merit based in terms of what you think should happen. What I don't quite understand, I'm, this is not a facetious question, you're also an expert on higher education. Why is it 
why screw around with vouchers at all? Why don't you just simply say that education in the United States should be as higher education, it's more or less privatized? I think that's actually would be the best solution. It might actually get around some of the questions. We'll get around regulation. the question. Right, and get around the regulation question. Get I think that's. Question. Just um, the whole thing. I mean, make it, make it essentially, and then you could, in fact, you know, if you were concerned about people not being able to uh, afford uh, any schooling, you could certainly make uh, subsidies available for low income people. Health grants for kindergartners. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess the only. Then the only question then is is whether or not you could keep education a compulsory program, and, and there are I think all 50 states have compulsory education laws. Uh, Tom Tancredo, a new um, member of Congress uh, elected from uh, uh, one of my home cities, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, I think just has initiated a program to abolish compulsory education. So that might be a solution. But I, I think that's a, I think that's um, actually. A somewhat radical solution. I might not be willing to go there as a first step, but it certainly is not one that um, uh, I would reject out of hand as an ultimate solution. <clears throat> Last question, because it's almost too good. Yes. Uh, can I go back to your concerns about uh, affirmative action on a, a higher education level? Um, I was on the State Board of Education in Michigan for several years. And there was great concern not only about getting the youngsters in, the minorities into the colleges, but retention and expulsion and dropouts, etc. I tried many, many times to find out if they had statistics on the retention of the public school students as versus the non-public school minority students. They'd never give it to me. They would avoid the question. And because I know that usually about 94% particularly of Catholic school, uh, high school kids, make it to college. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered what the retention rate, you know. Once they're in college. <laughs> Once they're in college, but as I said, they never wanted to give it to me. Well, I know I, which I, side of the fence I was on. And uh, I wondered if you've been able to get any figures. Uh, I haven't, but I would be happy if uh, you want to, I'll give you one of my cards, and I'd be happy to have one of our two staff lawyers uh, give you some language that you could use to draft a letter and demand the information. Uh, believe me, under freedom of information laws, they are required to give you the kind of data, if they, in fact, can um, if um, if on their um, their data collection there is a notation for public versus private and they have that data easily uh, collectible, uh, then they have to turn it over to you. Uh, you have a right to it. I'll give you my card before I leave. Thank you all very much.